This week on Writers Inc. It's got to be a joy. It has. I mean, so, you know, sometimes it can be hard, but you've got to want to do it. You've got to love it. You can't, you know, write to order. Whenever people are like, what should I watch? Sometimes people say, what should I write? What will get me published? And it's like, well, you can't think like that. You've just got to write what you love. And, and, what, and also because what publishers are looking for constantly changes. So if you look and think, oh, these books are really popular right now. I should try and write something like that. By the time you've written that and submitted it, those books will be like less, you know, that's old news. Publishers are looking for something else. So you, you can never try to, to write to fit a trend. You've just kind of got to write what, what you love because timing is a big part of it. And I was fortunate with the Chalkman that it kind of, I think, hit publishers and my agent at the right time. J.K. Rowling was nearly homeless when she wrote the first Harry Potter book. Stephen King penned Carrie in a small desk wedged between a washer and dryer. James Patterson worked in advertising and famously crafted the Toys R Us theme song long before becoming an author. Join New York Times bestseller J.D. Barker and indie powerhouses Jay Thorne and Zach Bohannon as they pull back the curtain on some of the world's most prolific authors. Where do they start? What is their process? The biggest names in publishing all have origin stories, all have tips and secrets. What does it take to consistently top the best seller lists and become a household name? Get your notepad out, school's in session. This is Writer's Inc. Hey, it's Christine Daigle. It's Patrick O'Donnell. It's J.P. Reinflush. It's Kevin Tomlinson. Hey, and I'm J.D. Barker. Welcome to Writer's Inc. So we've got yet another new face slash voice on this show, Patrick O'Donnell. Patrick, why don't you tell everybody who you are? Hey, I'm Patrick O'Donnell coming to you from the frozen tundra of Wisconsin, where I just got done snow blowing and shoveling for the second time in 24 hours. But it wasn't so bad because I had my Milwaukee Tools coat that I got for Christmas from my wonderful children. So I was battery operated. It was awesome. It kept all <laughs> kinds of warm. That and a baklava or bakla or not the Greek pastry, not baklava, but you know, the head oh, sock thing. Like Baklava? Yeah, yeah baklava, like yeah. But yeah, that and a hat. No, if you got the right gear, it's all good. But my name is Patrick O'Donnell. Like I said before, I was in law enforcement for 25 years. I worked in the city of Milwaukee, retired three years ago. And I got into the writing community kind of by sort of accident where I started writing post-apocalyptic fiction. And I would start going to writers conferences and inevitably somebody would come to me and say, well, you're that cop guy, right? And I'm not wearing like a t-shirt or anything. I'm not saying, hey, I'm a cop, you know, but they had cop questions, a lot of crime writers, and I was more than happy to help them. And it seemed like there was a need. So I built a little community. I wrote some books and I got a podcast. So here I am making all kinds of connections and meeting all kinds of people. Were you still wearing your sidearm? Because that's kind of a dead giveaway. <laughs> oh, you're not. Is that frowned upon? <laughs> It honestly it depends on where you are. <laughs> that is true. We've got some rental properties down in Tennessee, and you can walk into a Denny's, and half the people there are packing a, a, some kind of gun on their their hip. Yeah, there's open carry and concealed carry. And the saying goes, "Open carry, I think, is for people who kind of want to be braggadocious, and people that are concealed carry are the ones who want to like actually like protect themselves." But whatever, that's just me. All right. Well, welcome to the show. Um, we were just talking before we started recording about weather. I, I'm in New England and like it's raining right now. We, we got three or four inches <laughs> of snow the other day. Um, <laughs> totally excited because it was the first time we got anything that that resembled, you know, winter, like all winter long. Um, went out there with my brand new uh, battery operated snowblower from Cobalt, bought it over at Ooh. Lowe's, took it out of the box and put it together. It was missing two screws, which is always fun. So I had to finagle it and get it, get it going. And then it became this race with the battery indicator versus my driveway. Like, can I get to the bottom <laughs> before that battery? hits the, the little <laughs> flashing red. Um, the answer is no. Um, so I had to basically finish up with the, the regular shovel. So I, I spent about two hours out there working on the driveway. And then last night we got rain for like half the night and it literally just wiped all the snow away anyway. You know, it's like it was a complete waste of time. Um, but yeah, welcome to global warming and, and winter. So that is two mentions of, of tools, tool brand names. Are we being sponsored? Is that what you're trying to tell me? <laughs> Right here, thanks. Sponsored this week by Lowe's and Home Depot. I'm okay with that. And Milwaukee Tools. Um, <laughs> and Milwaukee Tools. But wait a second. Cool. You don't have a heated driveway? You seem like a high-speed guy. You know, <laughs> we uh, were that's actually just talking about me. that, too. 
<laughs> yeah, we, we talked, I talked about this a while back with Jay and Zach, like a year or two ago, and we were going to put the heated driveway in. Um, and it became this crazy project. My, my driveway, and I'll give you guys all the stats. It's 1,845 square feet. Um, wow. And I just, I know this now because of the, the heated driveway quotes, but there's basically <laughs> two ways you can go. They can either put um, basically like a radiator system underneath your driveway where they pump heated fluids through it, um, or you can do an electric. Um, now to do the, the water system just wasn't practical because they had to completely tear up the entire driveway and you can't put it over on top of asphalt. So they just, they, it just it was too much work. So we started looking at the electrical. The electric company said I would have to bring a pole in and they would have to basically bring in another 220 watt service or amp service or whatever they call it to the house. So that was another big project, but it went from a, a quote that started off around 50 grand to 120, 130. Um, so yeah, I put that one off and, and now we have no snow. So I don't know that it's even worthwhile. I, I actually bought, and, and this is going to really sound crazy. It is a robot snowblower um, <laughs> off a of Kickstarter. <laughs> Of course you do. Um, and, and yeah, and, and they're shipping. They're finally <laughs> shipping, but I haven't actually gotten it yet. So we'll see see how that thing plan, you know, pays or works if I actually do receive it. Um, but, you know, according to the videos that they have on Kickstarter, it works awesome and it should have no problems, but I haven't actually gotten one yet. So that's hopefully next year's project. Yeah. I have a 15-year-old. That's my snow removal system. <laughs> I highly recommend them. <laughs> I have Texas. <laughs> that's my <laughs> snow <laughs> removal process. <laughs> All right. Enough weather talk. JP, what's in the news? Yeah. So uh, Authors Guild filing a suit against the Authors Place Press. Uh, so 11 authors filed suit in the U.S. District Court of Florida against publishing company Authors Place Press over its failure to pay authors thousands of dollars in royalties. Um, overall, the lawsuit uh, is meant to send a message to any publishers who think they can get away with underpaying or not paying authors or taking advantage of them. I also think it's a good bit of news for authors to just be aware of what your contracts look like and the places that you uh, agree to work for. So has, has anybody here actually gone through this? Had a, had a publisher that didn't pay them? No, but I have talked to a lot of authors who have, uh, especially Same. during the, there was a, a whole thing with Harlequin, I think, at one point where all those romance writers were not being paid and couldn't get the rights back to their books. So it's pretty common. Yeah, I, I hear about it a lot, especially with, with smaller presses. They just kind of vanish from underneath their their authors. Um, I, I actually ran I went through this about a year and a half, two years ago, um, not because of the publisher, but because of the IRS. Um, so I started, I, I'm in 150 different countries, so I get checks and, and money from a lot of different places. And I have a spreadsheet where I track all this because I'm horribly anal about it. And I noticed certain countries, I, I wasn't receiving the payments that, that should have been coming in based on when I received them for past years. Uh, so I reached out to my agent and she she said that all of these payments are basically frozen overseas because the processing side of it that has to happen at the IRS uh, hasn't been happening. So like the paperwork just backed up on somebody's desk. Um, and until they actually filed it, this money would, couldn't be allowed into the U.S. So it's basically impacting anybody that was receiving these foreign royalties. Um, but it's a weird thing. Like it, it makes you realize just how out of control you actually are with, with your finances. You know, somebody else is sitting on X dollars and there's literally nothing you can do about it. Um, you know, I don't want to keep singing praises of indie authors. But, you know, I, I, Amazon has never missed a payment for me yet. You know, the, the 20th of the month, I get these, you know, those little emails telling you, hey, this just hit, this just hit, just, this just hit, mm -hmm. um, which is kind of nice when you're dealing with the flip side. Yeah. And I think it's kind of a good reminder to consider, regardless of if you're traditional or indie, what kind of guilds are out there that can support you um, that you'd be able to pay membership into. Um, because I think that we kind of forget that there are other authors just like us and collective voices make bigger differences. So it's always a, a means to kind of look into what can you join, what memberships can you join so that you do have uh, those safeguards in place. Yeah, but let's be honest, this is, this is symbolic at best. If the company is out of business, they're, they're suing yeah. air. Yeah, they're, they're not, they're not going to yeah. be able to collect on anything. But that's what's interesting is that they're out of business, but then there's still a rights issue. And so who's representing those rights? Um, there, that's that's why it's very very important that when you sign contracts like this, like you're passing this in front of an attorney to not just ask questions about what's in the contract, but what's not in the contract. Like, how what are the termination uh, 
guidelines. Like what happens when one of you needs to go? And uh, you need to have that very well outlined <laughs> before you go in. Yeah, that's a very big, you know, good point. I mean, because if you wanted to get your book back at this point, there's there's little, there's nothing you could do. Like you couldn't just take your book and throw it up on Amazon because your publisher is gone. You'd have to prove that that publisher no longer has the rights to that book because uh, yeah. most likely that publisher already has it with Amazon and the other ones, which means when you try to put that ISBN or that title up there, it's going to get red flagged and they're going to say, oh, wait a minute, so-and-so owns the rights to this, not you. And you're going to have to somehow prove that, you know, the, the opposite. So I guess in a, in a way, the lawsuit, if anything, is going to bring that out. It might create some type of court document that they can use to, to mm -hmm. get that back. But yeah, I mean, it, yeah. it could sit out there in limbo for a very long time. Yeah. Next up. Uh, so in lieu of our conversation about book talk last week, I found this event for Barnes and Noble hosting its first inaugural inaugural book talk festival. Uh, so I just thought this was overall really cool that uh, book talk has had such an influence uh, that it is now showing up uh, in Barnes and Noble of all places who's hosting it uh, and that those tickets have already sold out um, and major publishers are exhibiting and offering uh, advanced reader copies and other giveaways. So this seems like a pretty big event that has basically grown from the readership via TikTok. Kevin, I think you said that they jumped the shark last time we talked about book talk. <laughs> like to me, this yeah. feels very much like a jump the shark kind of moment, doesn't it? It does. It does. I don't think that I said they jumped the shark, but I, I feel like that's, that's the moment. Like this is it. Um, because there, it does seem, it does seem an awful lot like now they're pushing it. Like now they're mining mm -hmm. it. And I, I, you know, and ju just going by things I've experienced in the past when it comes to this sort of thing, like with Wattpad, they did something very similar with Wattpad. You know, they had this whole Wattpad authors table in their stores and then they started doing events and it was very close to that, that suddenly Wattpad wasn't a path anymore for, for, uh, <laughs> for breaking out. At least it doesn't, I don't think it is. I could be t entirely wrong about that. Well, when I saw that, I thought to myself, well, Barnes and Noble is kind of like the Twinkie after a nuclear holocaust. It just keeps on going. I mean, think of all the different <laughs> CEOs that they've had. They've gone through a lot. You know, just when you think they're down and out, then they're doing something different or whatever. And I think this might be part of that as well. I'm sure it is. I mean, they, they were bought out, if I remember correctly, by the same, um, I think it was an investment fund, um, the same one that owns, is it Waterstones? One of the large ones in the UK. Waterstones, yeah. yeah. yeah they, turned, they turned them around. Um, so they're trying a lot of these things here in the States. I, I, I saw a lot of shuffling in my local store right after that happened. Um, you know, the, the new release table kind of got moved around. Um, normally you would run into like the very first bookshelf was all the, the low price, you know, like last year's bestseller kind of things, all these hardbacks for five bucks. Um, and that all kind of went away and they, it, they created all these little nooks. There was a TikTok nook, there was an Etsy nook, there was eBay, um, all around the store. Um, and the funny thing is like right next door to this store in, in our shopping center is Best Buy. Um, and they've kind of gone through that same evolution. It used to just strictly be electronics. And then all of a sudden they had, you know, appliances and then they had this and then they had that. And like ours actually has books at this point. Um, so like these stores are just clawing at whatever they, they possibly can. Hadn't really considered getting my books into Best Buy, but now. <laughs> hey, want to be first, right? Why? Hey, man, if people will buy them by the millions from Best Buy, you can sure. count on me to be there. Yeah. And I think like every bookstore I've been in has a TikTok table now. So I think that's something you can't walk mm -hmm. by. But yeah, like, like you said, I wonder how long it's going to be before that's done. So yeah, very cool. So as a final bit of news, uh, I found this article from The Guardian uh, titled, If You Win the Popular Imagine, uh, Imagination, You Change the Game, Why We Need New Stories on Climate. Uh, I This is a very long article, uh, but I really enjoyed it as someone with a science background. Uh, and it really talked about how uh, the conversation around climate, especially as authors, is usually this like grim narrative because that's the easiest thing to fall into. That's the easiest thing for readers to believe. But as the article goes on to say, we're, we're kind of ignoring those stories about a livable future or a story where uh, we kind of focus on what are clear resolutions uh, that people can take and kind of reinsert that hope into uh, the idea of what future looks like with climate change. Uh, so I would recommend everyone go read this article because I could not do it justice, but I just wanted to toss that out there. I think that's a, I, I really like the point that it brought up because what we definitely hear a lot of is the doom and gloom, but we never hear, we never hear hope and we never hear solutions. And it's one thing to, to get up and chastise the world 
for um, you know the state of things and to, to to say we need to do better and uh, you know kind kind of come down on everybody. But then you just sort of alienate everyone. You leave them mm-hmm. wondering like, well, what am I supposed to do about it? You know, and it it I do like the fact like you brought this up in the write up that um, we're kind of uh, acclimated to the, the idea that there's going to be a solution. And there's no single solution to problems mm-hmm. like this. It, it does, it's all going to come down to what everyone can do at a personal level, what you can do at a uh, you know local level, what you can do at a federal and a global. You know, it just kind of has to start small and grow. And small small steps are going to be the answer. Uh, but I, I I'm always I'm always very uh, I get irritated and tired when I'm being preached to <laughs> by mm-hmm. people who talk about this, because they don't give me an answer. You don't give me an, anything to do next. You have to build a rocket and go to Mars. That's, that's, yeah. the, that's the only answer. That's my solution. Oh. <laughs> I'll volunteer. That's really I'm cool. leaving. <laughs> I, I think, frankly, we hear about the doom and gloom just because it's better entertainment, right? No, mm-hmm. Nobody right. We, we had the conversation about the utopia the other day, a few episodes back. And like people don't write books about a utopia because it's boring. You know, like it's just it's not something that, you know, lights your fire. Um, it, it, I think if somebody actually found an angle where they could make some money off of talking about the positive aspects of fixing some of these things, they'd be all over it. But, you know, again, it's on the flip side. The people that are making money are the ones that are actually trying to solve the problems, people pushing the products to to actually fix it in a certain way. And they're, they're the loudest voices when it comes to this. Um, yeah. I think that's why we tend to hear them the most. Well, awesome. OK, so let's get on to some business before we get to our interview. We want to give a wonderful shout out to our sponsor, Later Press. Later Press is a platform built to help authors declare independence. It lets authors create digital books and sell them directly to readers through a branded website. Later Press is free to publish on and doesn't take any commission on direct sales. It's one of the most effective ways readers can directly support authors they love. Get started today at LaterPress.com. So JD, who's up this week? This week we've got CJ Tudor. She's the best-selling author of The Chalk Man, as well as numerous others. Her latest is called The Drift, and it released uh, or releases January 31st. Here she is, CJ Tudor. You have a new book, The Drift, which centers Yay! around the struggle to survive in a snowy post-apocalyptic world. Do you want this to tell us a little true. bit about it? Yeah, tell us about it. Yeah, well, um, yeah, I mean, I, I had the idea, funny enough, I mean, it's it's set against, basically, the, the, the sort of the setup is there are, there are three groups of people in this sort of undisclosed snowy location in a, in a in snowy mountains in a huge snowstorm. Um, so there's Hannah, and she's found herself trapped in a crashed coach with some other students who've been evacuated from um, a rather elite boarding school in the mountains. Um and they're trapped and the snow is coming down and they need to find a way to get out, basically. Um, and there's another group of people um, who are in a cable car that is stranded high above the mountains that has suddenly stopped. There's been a power cut and it's stranded um, and they've no idea how they got there. They've been drugged. They wake up on this cable car. They're heading to this strange place called the retreat. Um, but they, you know, they don't know how they've got on this cable car. And then they find out that amongst their number of sort of half a dozen people, there's a dead body. And then the final group of people are in a, a chalet, which is known as the retreat, um, high up in the mountains. Um, and they're keeping this place kind of running. But, you know, the power is going, the snowstorms trap them all inside. They've got various issues with each other. And there's something something else going on at the chalet, shall we say, that if the power cuts, that, that could prove problematic. So there's, there's three different strands and they all tie together. And yet it's set against a kind of, I say, sort of you know um post-viral um pandemic post-apocalyptic kind of background which sounds massively cheery um, <laughs> I, should, I should sort of point out that it's kind of you know that the, the story kind of centers on the characters more but this is kind of the backdrop um and it was yeah it was a, it was a bit of a change of direction for me and I had the idea back in 2019 so it was way before kind of covid or anything happened um and I had this idea for this for this story that I, you know, I thought would be would be fun to write um, and really interesting. Just it was it was a new challenge for me as a writer. Um, and then it kind of got delayed by a couple of years because I had another book that I was contracted to write. Um, and then that book ended up not working out because of various reasons, because of the pandemic happened, mm-hmm. the lockdowns happened, and I lost my dad. And oh. you know, the world kind of, you know, my world kind of was a very different place when I came out of it. And um, the book that I had written, I, I just hated um you know the one I was contracted to write and I had to say to my publishers I, I can't I can't go back and edit it I, I, I don't 
I don't want to put it out there, basically. And they were very kind and um, understanding and said, what do you want to write? And I went, well, I have this slightly weirder idea that I would be pondering on. And, uh, and that was the drift. Um, and it's been sort of a passion project, really, to write, because it is something of a change of direction from my previous books, kind of post-apocalyptic, a bit dystopian, uh, a bit more horror, I think, than previous books, um, with this kind of kind of mystery at the heart of it. You know, the mystery at the heart of it is this connection these three groups have um, and, and what's really sort of going on. Um, so, yeah, so it was kind of born out of that. And in a weird way, I think, had I tried to write it when I initially had the idea, I don't think I would have had kind of the experience in a weird way to put into the book that I had writing it after we'd all been through the pandemic and COVID because there was kind of almost real life experience there to draw on by that stage. So it's sometimes strange how books work out. That's a brave thing to do to switch writing when you've already put all this time into a book that you're contracted to write and just to say, you know what? (laughs) Yeah, it was, it was a kind of, it was a, a weird, scary thing to do. Um, but I spoke a little bit about it on Twitter because I think it's sometimes nice to understand, you know, p- often people and authors talk about the successes and the good stuff and wow, I've got this great best oh, that's come out and everyone, this book's amazing. And, and so I think it's good to go, do you know what, I wrote a book and it didn't work. I wasn't happy with it. It didn't work. And for all these reasons, I hated it. I hated this book and I didn't want to put it out there. And I, I had to go, no, I know I've spent eight or nine months working on it, but, but you know what, you know, sometimes you have to reach the end of a book to know whether it's going to work or not. And no, it's, it's, it's going to one side. And I don't think it will ever see the light of day in, in the form of a book, though I have kind of taken bits of it and put sort of in a short story. But, you know, sometimes that happens. Sometimes something doesn't work out. And I think it's just as, you know, valuable to talk about the, the failures as it does the successes sometimes as well. Yeah, and it, it makes it more real. You know, people are, are reluctant to talk about things like that or having to work a day job. Yeah. Just out of curiosity, how many unfinished or half-finished manuscripts do you have? I, I was a, I've got probably a lot of unfinished. I was a great starter of stuff. What was it? it? Took me ten years to get published. So it was. I was certainly not an overnight success. So, you know, I started. I didn't start writing seriously to get published till my mid thirties. Um, and yeah, I have a, a number. I, I, from, I always had was I would. I thought it was a great idea, and I would. I would start a book, and I'd get to the kind of tricky stage because there's always a tricky stage in a book, and quite often you have another idea you would think is better. And I would constantly go, do this book's getting hard work and this shiny new idea will be brilliant. It'll be, uh, this will be so easy to write. And I always say to people now, it's like, whenever you're in a tough part of a book, you've got to soldier on through it because you don't know till you get to the end. Um, and don't be tempted by the shiny new idea because the shiny new idea will also reach a stage, which is hard work. So I had many of those um, that were put to one side and a couple of, and another, another fully written book. I, I had an agent prior to the agent I have now um many years ago now when I first started trying to get published and they took me on and I tried to work on a book with them and I had a similar well I had a similar experience of a book not working in that obviously I like to mix horror and thrillers mm-hmm. um and they kind of wanted me to be much more kind of more traditional crime so I sort of presented them with this book and then they tried to strip it of all my weird stuff and we sort of wrestled with it for well over a year and a half till eventually they went no we're not taking it to a publisher it's not it's not good enough it doesn't work which was kind of crushing um but I sort of learned from that experience. I, I decided eventually to leave them because it wasn't working out that, you know, although it's hard to get an agent, it's better not to have an agent than have the wrong agent. Um, Cause that can actually be worse. Cause all your, your hopes kind of get crushed even more. You get an agent that think, wow, I'm going to be published. It's all going to be brilliant. And then to not even have the book, you know, ever reach a publisher and waste, not waste time, but spend a lot of time on something that doesn't work out um, was harder. So I, I sort of was burnt then. And, and, and I let you, you learn from experience, don't you? But yes, in, in answer to your question, many, 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 <laughs> as most authors have, I think, you know, finished books and half finished books. Yeah. And leaving an agent, I mean, you know, getting the agent is the dream when you're going through yeah. the querying process. And how did you just realize, you know, this agent doesn't share my vision? And then that must have been extremely difficult. How do you get the courage to do that and to keep believing in yourself and your writing? It was at the, at the time I was I was miserable because I was doing a day job, obviously, as well. You know, I was working I was working as a freelance writer and part time dog walker to make ends meet and trying to do the writing. And, yeah, you do. It's, it's so tough to get an agent. You know, anybody who's tried knows, you know, that, you know, the rejection slips coming back or rejection emails these days. Because, um, you know, I was, this is even the days where you were sending off the, you know, the hard copy mm-hmm. still. Um, 
And it is so tough. So when you get an agent take you on, it's amazing. You think this is it. This is it. It's gonna, it's gonna happen for me. Um, and then we went through the whole process. But but I, I you know I think I started to realise quite quickly that in order to get published with this particular agent, I would kind of have to. It sounds dramatic to say sell my soul, but but I wasn't writing what, what I wanted to write. All the fun of writing, all the joy of it, was slowly getting sucked out of me. And after the first book being rejected and I tried to write another one for them and then the same process started to happen. And I just realised I was thoroughly miserable and all the things that I loved about writing. So I do think you have to love it. You've got to love it. You can't just write to be published because what's the point in that? You know, it's, what, it, it's got to be a joyous thing. Um, and I just thought, you know, I don't, maybe being published is not the be all and end all. You know, maybe... I don't want to lose the love of writing and I'm just miserable at the moment. I'm not writing what I want to write. Um, and they, they told them telling me that, that, you know, my, when I sort of said I was leaving that my mixture of sort of horror and thriller was unpublishable. And I always remember that. Um, but I was like, well, maybe it is, but you know, I, you know, and they were kind in many other ways. They, they've always said, you know, we love your writing. We think your writing is great, but we think what you want to write about is wrong essentially. Um, and I was a bit like, well, I don't, <laughs> but I, I didn't really have that confidence. I just knew I was miserable. And then as soon as I left, I thought it was the stupidest thing I'd ever done in my life because it took me probably another six or seven years to get the agent I have now. But, you know, in the meantime, I kept writing. I wrote short stories. I sold a few of those to some women's magazines. I managed to win a couple of competitions with things, which gives you confidence and at least makes you feel maybe I'm not totally kidding myself here. I can write, you know, I perhaps just haven't happened upon that book yet that's going to be the one that will get me there. But I'd also developed, I'd also got a bit calmer about it, I think, because in during that time, I, I felt pregnant and I had my daughter. Um, I set up my own dog walking business and I was kind of at the stage where I went, you know what, life isn't that bad, you know, because I've got this beautiful daughter I had at 41. I never thought that might happen. And, you know, things things were OK. Money was tight, very, very tight. But, you know, it was okay. And it was like, if I don't get published, it's not the end of the world. You know, things will tick along happily. And I've got my lovely little family. And oh, and then I had the idea for the chalk man. And then everything kind of took off. But if it hadn't, I wouldn't have been unhappy. I'd have carried on writing for the love of it, even if I never had that break, as lots of people don't. So sometimes I think just relaxing and not you know, pressuring yourself sometimes, I think perhaps helps in these things. Yeah, that's a great perspective. Just finding the joy in your writing and yeah, yeah, it's got to be. It's got to be a joy. It has. I mean, so, yeah. Sometimes it can be hard, but you've got to want to do it. You've got to love it. You can't, you know, write to order. Whenever people are like, "What should I watch?" Sometimes people say, "What should I write? What will get me published?" And it's like you can't think like that. Mm -hmm. You've just got to write what you love. And and because what and also because what publishers are looking for constantly changes. So if you look and think, "Oh, these books are really popular right now. I should try and write something like that." By the time you've written that and submitted it, those books will be like less, you know, that's old news. Yeah. Publishers are looking for something else. So you, you can never try to, to write to fit a trend. You've just kind of got to write what, what you love because timing is a big part of it. And I was fortunate with the Chalkman that it kind of, I think, hit publishers and my agent at the right time. Yeah. And that, that's good advice. So now you are writing what you love, which is fantastic. And definitely the drift has this horror feel to it there's a yes. lot of tension a lot of terrifying things what <laughs> entices you about writing the forbidden what do you love about it it's weird isn't it because you know I know sort of a number of other sort of horror writers and dark thriller writers and, and the first thing is that they're all the nicest people you could possibly meet and they're all incredibly cheery generally <laughs> the complete opposite I don't I think sometimes it, it must be to do with putting those dark fears on the page and getting them out there. I also know a lot of other writers who write dark stuff who, like me, with children who are absolutely terrified of everything, you know, with, with very vivid imaginations who, you know, would have nightmares and constantly think there was something under the bed or, or outside the door or in the closet. Or um, So I think perhaps sometimes that's part of it as well, never growing out of the childhood fears. But, you know, it's a great way to channel them, to put them into a story and put them on the page. And, and, and I've never stopped... You know, as as a child, you always think you see something creepy or something dark happening. You know, in 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 lots of scenarios. And as an adult, I still think that. You know, it's it's still sort of. I remember when I was living in a house on my own, sort of a long time ago now, and it was it was an old terraced house, and it had a cellar, 
and the door to the cellar was in the living room in the corner and it never quite shut properly it didn't lock it didn't shut properly mm. see your face yeah i don't like that at all <laughs> you no i couldn't it was every night i would say i'm just constantly there's this cellar this i guess this hand i kept seeing creeping around it in my head and eventually i had to move a bookcase in front of it because i just couldn't live with it and i think that's the the sort of the the horror writer's mind that you always see the the dark thing in, in even you know quite normal sort of circumstances um you know never never ask a horror or, thr- or thriller writer what's the worst that could happen in any situation because they'll be like well let me tell you and I think that's that's where your mind goes sometimes um and the attraction of it though I don't I don't know it's interesting isn't it because I funnily enough I don't watch an awful lot of horror movies because I just, I just get too scared. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, I will still go to bed and be like, I can't, I can't sleep. I'll have to have a light on or something because my mind, you know, just over overworks it. Um, but, but there is attraction to dark stuff, perhaps like as children as well. We're attracted to things we're scared of. And again, I think that writers perhaps never grow out of that. The attraction is going into those things, fight, writing about those things that scare us and perhaps dissecting them um, mm. in our stories a little bit as well. Perhaps by getting them out there. It, it helps, you know, us look at our fears. I think there's a degree of that as well. And perhaps also, you know, in any kind of mystery, murder, horror, you generally, not always, have a resolution, you know, where it, it's all okay. You know? yeah. <laughs> it's, a happy, it's all okay and the monsters have been defeated. And, and so I think there's, there's that element of, you know, it's, it's quite comforting in a way, you know, right. to think that, you know, it, it can all be sorted out and it's all good at the end. Not always. <laughs> not in every book yeah so kind of a like fairy tales I guess are that way this is the worst thing that can happen but you'll be okay that's yeah. kind of that exploration fairy tales are so dark aren't they you know if you've read <laughs> they the, are. the originals you know the Grimm Brothers and stuff and it has Christian Anderson as well even mm-hmm. they're really quite dark you know not yeah. the sanitized versions we've got no. <laughs> <laughs> So another thing I wanted to ask uh, about the drift is that I noticed one theme coming up consistently throughout the book was that survival is selfish. Um, Yes. (laughs) You know, the consequences of who does and does not survive seems directly Mm -hmm. related to how selfish their actions are. I'm curious, is that something that you thought about while you were writing it or something that just sort of naturally came out? I think it naturally came out of writing the book. I think probably part of it had, had I, I think part of it probably as well came out of going through the pandemic sometimes as well. Because I think we talked a lot during the pandemic of, of that idea that the people who perhaps wouldn't, didn't want to get vaccinated, I'm, I'm not coming down either side of this, didn't want to get vaccinated or wouldn't wear masks, were quite often accused of being selfish and not looking out for other people. And there was a lot of perhaps some people going, well, you know, I don't think I'm going to get very ill, so why should I? care type of thing you know I'm looking after number one I think human nature can be like that I think you know you push some people into a very extreme stressful situation and some people can react by going I want to look at just after myself or perhaps my immediate family because they're the most important thing and people I don't know strangers are not as important to me I think that's part of human nature so you know I, I sometimes think if we are all pushed into the very extreme situations and my characters in the drift are in very extreme situations of survival that I think I have to say on some part it starts out as a group we all you know everyone's trying to look out for each other and they all want to escape but gradually you know you'll get rifts you'll get divisions and slowly it, all, it becomes about well I want to get out of this alive and quite frankly screw everyone else <laughs> you know? yeah and, and I do think that that you know survival and human nature I think often is selfish I think people that that do survive extreme situations I'm not saying they would you know throw others to the walls literally or metaphorically but I think there has to be a little bit of that 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 selfish self-preservation sometimes to survive things Um, and it's interesting to examine that I think you know I'm a mum and I and I you know obviously I think you know I would sacrifice myself in an instant for my daughter but I wouldn't probably do it for a stranger yeah (laughs) yeah um but I think that's 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 natural I think you know we are kind of you know at the end of the day we're kind of you know big walking on two feet animals and I think you know survival is selfish in that regard I think self-preservation um you know comes down to me and perhaps my immediate family sometimes um and you know yeah I I guess when it comes down to you or someone else we're all kind of programmed to look up to, to keep to live you know at the end of the day it's it's almost like it's a you know it's an instinct it's almost like we can't help it we we're gonna we want to live even if that might be at the expense of someone else I think 
Um, so yeah, so it's an interesting thing to look at, really. And I don't think that necessarily makes anyone a bad person. I think it's 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 just a natural response to want to survive at, at you know the cost of anything else, really. Yeah, and uh, it was just interesting to me, and like you know, to your credit, there were so many layers, and you know, it's like people look, like, it's a thriller, but there were so many layers thematically, whether intentional or not, uh, even about a message about how an apocalypse can happen because. Ordinary people just fail to see the other side. Um, yeah. And it seemed pretty timely. So I think I think that was, yeah. And, and I think it's true sometimes, isn't it? I think, you know, I think sometimes, and, and again, I felt this quite strongly during sort of, you know, when the pandemic is that, you know, people felt started to divide and fall into camps. And and rather than sort of working for a common good, were fighting against each other. People find it very hard to, to see the other person's point of view. And I think that, I, I don't know, it's, that seems to, I don't know, I, I feel that in the UK more, we're more divided, not necessarily because of the pandemic, perhaps because of other things too. But I think increasingly people can't seem to or, or don't want to relate to another person's point of view. People take, they dig in, they take their stance and that's it. And there's there's no reasoning. It's like, I think this, I, I, you know, I will just cannot possibly see your side. Um and I do wonder if that's how society starts to crumble and people can't get together and work together for a common good. You kind of think that things, when terrible things happen, like something apocalyptic happens, that people will come together, you know, to, as we call it in the UK, the blitz spirit, as they always talk about, you know, from the Second World War, will come together to work, to look after each other and survive. I don't think that necessarily is, is true sometimes. Perhaps that again goes back to that survival instinct. I think sometimes it, it can go the other way. Um, and people become more divided and, and, and more sort of antagonistic towards each other. So it, it's, it's interesting looking at, at it. And it, it was interesting writing at it, coming, having sort of gone, gone through what we all went through um, with the pandemic um, and putting that into the book, really. And, yeah, I, I, this idea that, you know, society won't crumble because, because of, you know, one terrible thing happening. But it, it crumbles when people don't look out for each other anymore, when they don't support each other, when they're fighting against each other. That's how kind of the world ends I think you know not with not with a bang but but with people just falling out and you know fighting and and war and you know fighting against each other rather than working together yeah that was a great message yeah I mean we want to survive we've got to take each other's perspectives right <laughs> yeah it, and the, the positive from that is to say you know if we can if we could all press if we could all just get along a bit better <laughs> and listen to each other and try and understand you don't always have to agree but you can try and understand, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I want to ask a little bit of a question in a different direction. Why does being an only child lend itself well to novel writing? Oh, that's an interesting one. I've never thought about it. Are there, are there a lot of only childs? Only, ch- only childs? Only children? Only children? You're an only child. I am, yeah. I'm an only child. I'm trying to think if I know other authors who are only children as well. I think, I don't see if you agree with me on this then. I think it's because you haven't got brothers or sisters to play with. And so you're kind of forced to use your imagination to entertain yourself. You know, you're forced to create imaginary friends and imaginary worlds because you haven't got sort of real playmates to hand. That's how, I think that's definitely how it was for me. I lived in a complete imaginary world for most of my childhood. I would every day I'd invent a new thing that, you know, I was a new sort of scenario that I was living in and, and sort of play it out through the day. So uh, that's how I think. What do you do? You think yeah, I, I agree with you because, you know, you have your parents then just like get out of here, go play and you're by yourself. So what are yeah, you going to do? You have to make like things <laughs> up, right? Friends and worlds yeah. and things that are interesting to do. Right? And I think that's how the writing in a way comes about as well, because I also found that I could write and create any world. I could put myself in it, you know, put myself in any world by writing a story, you know, which was, again, a great it's like, my God, this is all I could write as if it's real. You know, I can be anywhere in this story. Um, and reading again, you know, like you say, if you've got no one else to play with or do stuff with, and you know, I'm I'm 51, so of course there was not there weren't iPads or anything like that, you know, when I was a kid. So books, books were the escape again as well. Yeah. So yeah, I think I, I that's why I think the imagination sort of comes from. I'm not saying obviously, you know, you, you know, people with brothers and sisters don't have imagination and can't write, but I think that's definitely what sparked it for me. Yeah. Uh, and I agree with that. And I just thought that was interesting. I said, oh, only child here. We're just lonely. We need to make our own friends. It's in our true. Own We're world. just sad and lonely. I've had imaginary friends, you know. My, my daughter's an only child. Um, 
and I, I see the same thing in her sometimes that but I think that the great gift it gives you as an only child and I, I wanted brothers and sisters when I was when I was younger I probably would have hated it as I grew older to be honest I was quite glad to be an only child but I sort of see it with my little girl as well that I think it makes you quite self-sufficient you're, you're good at entertaining yourself and you're good at being on your own which I think is a really good thing to have as you grow into an adult to be content in your own company my little girl's nine and a half and she's very good at during lockdown I keep going back to it, don't I but a lot of people say oh my children are terrible it's awful they, you know I, I, they drive me mad and I'm trying to work and then, whereas Betty was was it's really good at getting on with stuff and entertaining herself I'm like I've got to do some work she'll be like oh it's okay mum and she'll go and she'll get her iPad out and she might do some crafting she likes filming herself doing crafting because she watches YouTubers and things and she might watch a bit of this and make something and then do something else and the other day, the other day this is brilliant She's watching. Do you have Danger Mouse in in the US? Yes, yeah. It's a cartoon, right? So mm-hmm. she, she likes loves Danger Mouse. And she was watching that. So she came up with a theory because she she and she's very bright. She says, I, "I I think the Colonel might actually be a secret baddie because because there's a picture of him there on a baddie's baddie's phone contact list." So she went and did a PowerPoint presentation <laughs> on why she thought the Colonel might actually be a double agent. <laughs> Oh, I love that. Yeah, I have an only two and he is so good at entertaining himself. I'm like, sometimes I don't even know he lives here. <laughs> so, if we work from home, it is handy, it. isn't it? You know? <laughs> that's excellent. Uh, we'll have to do a survey and see how many uh, only children are. Yeah. Are we disproportionate yeah. in the writing community? It could be interesting. Or maybe brothers and sisters that have big age gaps as well, because my brother's got a big age gap with his sister and he often says he might well be an only child because there's eight years between them. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Ah. So I want to ask a little bit more about your early career. I believe, did you write commercials before you started writing fiction? I used to write, yeah. I mean, I've had had so many jobs. Um, (laughs) I've just so many. (laughs) It's it's a bit like I almost couldn't settle working for other people. I needed to work for myself. I used to write radio commercials. Um, You know, the, the awful stuff you get on the radio where it's like, come down here now and it's a family fun day. We've got a sale and all that sort of stuff. And then I, I used to voice some of them as well um, mm-hmm. for radio stations. So I did that for a while, um, both employed by people and self-employed. And I worked for an advertising agency for a little bit as well as a copywriter, um, which which I always thought I'd really enjoy doing. But I actually hated it because all mm-hmm. the accounts I worked on were like really dull. <laughs> so it was just not interesting whatsoever. Um it was one of those places as well. You, you like literally sometimes there just wouldn't be work to do, and you just be sat there going, "I, I don't know why I'm here. Why, why am I here? What? I mean, they're paying me, but I don't know why I'm here." So, did you use those skills at all in your fiction, or was it just like too dull and <laughs> not really translating over? I actually think that the good thing, if I, because I don't know what your background is before writing, but I think if you if you've worked in commercials or, or like copywriting, what I found was was really useful was that it teaches you to edit. Because for radio commercials and for, and for obviously if, you, if you're doing stuff in print, you have to be able to cut something down to either a certain length or to fit a certain size on a page because people are paying for a certain amount of space. Um, so I, 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 it taught me to really cut stuff back to the bone to just say what I needed to say. And I think that's a really useful um, skill to have as a writer, to, to be able to teach yourself to edit um, and also to look for that, that good payoff line as well. Yeah, you know, at the end of a chapter or something, after a snappy line, I think coming from as a copywriting background, you, you never lose that wanting to have a, a good line or a good strap strap line or something, or end on a, a nice line in a chapter. So I think I think those are, those are quite good skills to bring to writing. That's interesting. Yeah, maybe writing like jacket copy or taglines and things like that. <laughs> yeah, because because like, I end up writing a lot of my the jacket copy and stuff. So I always give my like agent or, or, and editors like a bit of blurb and rundown. Um, when I sort of submitting a, a new book, um, quite a lot of that does end up on the jacket and, and, and stuff. Um, so I think that's that's quite a good sort of skill to have. And and I mean, I talk about editing as well. I I nearly always end up giving my book to my editor, and she's always like, "I think you can actually pad it out a bit more." <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> okay. It's like it's very spelt. Yeah, chopping <laughs> stuff. Can't you put put some stuff back in? That's excellent. <laughs> Um, so I wanted to ask about the Burning Girls. So it's being filmed for Paramount Plus, I think, with um, yes, The yeah. Walking Dead, Samantha Morton and Bridgerton. I know Ruby That's Stokes. Exciting. That's amazing. I know, brilliant. Have you been involved in that at all in any of the writing or adaptation? Or are you more hands off? I've been to visit the sets. I mean, the cast groups. We've got Samantha Morton. There's Rupert Graves, Ruby Stokes, Conrad Khan, another brilliant young actor who's in it. Um, who's in Peaky Blinders. Um, there's Jack Roth, who's Tim Roth's son. There's David Dawson, who was recently um, 
in My Policeman with Harry Styles. Um, it's just it's a brilliant, a brilliant cast. Um, and I've been, you know, I, have, I haven't been able to say hands on. I'm very much like, it was Hans Rosenfeld was doing the script. So I was a bit like, well, yeah, I think we're fine <laughs> with the script, you know. <laughs> I don't think he needs my input. Um, and I thought it was in very safe hands. Um, they were very, the, the production team were really good at going through the book with me beforehand. And we went in a lot of detail about plots and how I saw certain characters and so on. Um, and I've been to visit the set twice, which has been great to meet some of the actors um, and see some of the filming, which is very exciting. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was really good. Um, but I felt I've been lucky that I've, they've been great, the production team. They've, they've kept me informed all the way and I felt very confident with them. So I've been you know, really happy to let them just kind of get on with it. And the bits I have seen have been great. I went down to some filming with the two young actors, Ruby Stokes and Conrad Khan. Um, they were just so good. So I'm like, oh, I'm quite excited now. <laughs> Because there's always, there's, I suppose there's always that worry. You think, oh my God, I hope it will, it'll come out all right and, and, and be good. Um, but yeah, it's, it's looking really, really good. And it's it, it's strange though, because, you know, you, you write this book and then it got optioned. Then it was like, oh my God, it's, it's actually been greenlit and they're going to make it. But it all feels a little bit surreal. And then you, then you turn up to us, like they built the church in, in the book. They built as a set. So they didn't find a real building. So, it, but they built a whole graveyard. It's like fake graves and trees, and you look, it looks real. And then you go in the back, and of course, it's not real. Yeah. And they're like, people, and there's all these people and lights and crew. And it's like, oh my God, this is like all for my book. <laughs> this is just bonkers. And it's suddenly like, oh my God, I can't believe this. They're, they're actually doing it. Oh, it's so exciting. Yeah. When they, you know, That's very, very strange. It's like, I can't believe they've taken this thing that came out of my head, and all these people are involved in it now. <laughs> Now it's real. And do you know when it's, um, do they have a, a an air date, a release date in mind yet? Or I think is it still too early? They finished filming on December the 10th and then they're in post-production, I think they said till March, April. So it will probably go out because, you know, obviously TV is long-winded um, yep. next autumn now. Um, and this, and this okay. has moved quite quickly. Yeah. <laughs> actually. Uh, but yeah, because it's, it's, it's obviously, it's an autumn kind of dark, creepy, Halloween-y um, type of series perfect for curling up on dark winter nights and watch all these creepy goings on in this strange little village so I think that will be you know perfect timing for it so yes yeah, so it's, it's exciting and um yeah it'll be interesting to sort of see it and of course I've already got my mother moaning because she's like boy I don't have Car- I don't have Paramount Plus <laughs> why, why can they put on ITV <laughs> like, we'll, have, we'll have to try and record it for you have to come around Mom, to see there you it. go yeah that's excellent oh that's very exciting I can't wait to see it it is, it, is, it is really cool. Yeah. So I have one last question for you. Ooh, okay. If you could offer one piece of advice to new and aspiring authors, what would it be? Oh, crumbs. Um, persevere. I think that's one of them. Um, it just, you know, enjoy it. If you love writing, you know, I like someone says, you know, you know, if you're a writer, if, you know, you try and stop writing, you, you simply can't. Um just keep writing keep writing stuff you love don't think in a way don't think about being published if you you know you've got a great a great idea you want to you know write as a book write it finish it it sounds really crazy but finish it <laughs> because as I talked about before it's so easy to get to that point and every author has it part way through a book where it becomes hard work and you're suddenly unsure of what you're writing and you think it's terrible this is the worst thing in the world I'm never going to make it all work and finish it and you, you have to get over that hump in every book that will happen. Get over the hump, finish the book um, and then then make your judgment on whether, you know, you, you think you produce something you're happy with. But don't be tempted by the bright, shiny new idea, because that's why there'll always be a bright, shiny idea. It will not be any easier to write than this book. So don't get tempted. Save. But, but save it. If you've got another idea, it's great, because I think it's nice to have another idea as a writer, because if, for example, you write a book and submit it and you get the dreaded rejection letters, um, you've got something else that you can be working on, you know? And, so, and sometimes it isn't the first book or the second book. You might be really lucky, it might be the first book, but don't be disheartened because rejection happens to all of us. Um, and, and just, you know, keep plugging away at it. And sometimes I think the important thing to remember is that if if you do get rejected, if you write a book and it gets rejected, it's it's nothing to do with you being rubbish, you know? Um, yeah, well, maybe you are, I don't, but, but a publisher said to me, and I always remember this, he said, Every day we turn down brilliant books just simply because it's not it's not the right genre. We've got another author doing something similar. 
it, we just don't think the market's right for it at that time. There, there's so much to do with timing and luck, uh, with, with so many things. So, you know, it doesn't mean that you're not a good writer or not that that, that book might be right at another time. So keep going at it and don't get disheartened because there are very few overnight successes, I think, in publishing. You talk to any author, any debut, you know, look at this debut, this new writer. They'll have like half a dozen books behind them that didn't go anywhere or got rejected. So, you know, and enjoy writing, you know, just enjoy it. And, and hopefully, fingers crossed, you know, if you persevere, you'll get that break. So if someone was coming to kill you, would you sacrifice yourself for your spouse or trip them and get away? That's what I want to know. <laughs> Wait, spouse or, or just anyone in kids my Kids are too easy. It can't be kids. So it has to be like... Option two. Option two. <laughs> I like my spouse. So yeah, yeah. my first wife, <laughs> that's a no-brainer. But I'm on <laughs> wife number two. <laughs> Is this the same as that, that question? Like you just have to run faster than the other guy or the bear or something? I, I forget yes. how that one goes. But yeah. The zombie, yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I, I remember hearing this like back when I was around 18 or 19, a buddy of mine had a baby and like he explained this, you know, kind of the way CJ did, you know, like you know, a car is about to hit, you know, somebody. Are you going to jump in front of the, the car, push them out of the way and take the hit? Um, for most people, the answer is no until you substitute your kid in there. And like that, that actually changes that. Like, that's like your children are the only people I think most, you know, other people are willing to actually do that for. Um, spouse, you know, it, it depends on the day. I think. See, that's like the unique part about being a cop was I've run into I've run into two burning houses, and let me tell you, that's crazy. Yeah, you know, I'm walking in there, my partner's like, "You're nuts," and I'm, I go in there and I'm like, "Wow, it's really warm." It, you literally feel like you're walking into an oven, and secondly, you can't breathe. And I'm like, "This is nothing like TV. This sucks." Yeah, <laughs> and so you know, that's the one thing about cops. It's like you know, I've hung from a bridge, you know, hanging on to like a guy's leg, you know, stuff like that. And you don't think you just do. So certain people are wired. It's like, you don't even think twice. You just do it for a complete stranger. Well, that is not me. <laughs> I guess I'm selfish. I'm, I'm in the same boat as CJ. Um, she, she brought up something else that I, I'm kind of curious. So how, how many of you have started a book and then something shiny came along and you moved on to another book and then put that first book aside? Like, do you do that? I, I have done it. I don't do it now, but I have done it in the past. But now, it I, I, part of my principles, uh, I have to finish. If I start a book, I have to finish it. That's my rule now, even if I'm not going to publish it. Because it's, it's if I was committed enough to start it, I, you know, I need to see it through. Yeah, I'm the same. There's just too many shiny things. So if you let yourself get distracted, then you're just distracted all the time. You're just jumping onto new projects. So I feel like when you commit, you have to commit and finish that. I mean, if I, I guess if you get to a point where you just realize it's not working, that's a different thing than jumping onto a new shiny object. That's when I loop back. Yeah. She was contracted to write a book, like under contract, and then was like, no, this doesn't work. I'm done. I'm, I'm, have you ever done that? Like switched from a book you've been contracted to write? I have. We, we've talked about this one on the show. I've, I've got a, a haunted house book that I basically wrote. Um, and it starts off, you know, I, I did, the, I, I wrote the whole book and turned it into my agent. And she's like, yeah, I just, that ending, I'm not quite sure. And it's, I went off in the supernatural kind of realm um, with the book. And like, I, and I teased it at the beginning. So it's not like it was a surprise to anybody reading it. But my biggest problem, and I'm, I'm really starting to see this now that I've got some real sales behind me, is I, I sell like 10 thrillers for every one horror novel that I, that I write. Um, and I'm not, the only one seeing this. My publishers are very much aware of it too. So when I hand in a book that, you know, could have been a thriller in their eyes and it's got a supernatural element, they see that as a red flag and it doesn't matter how good it is. Um, so I was basically in the same boat that CJ was talking about. You know, they, they wanted me to strip out the, the paranormal supernatural type stuff and turn it into a straight up thriller, um, which I, I, I'm currently doing right now. I just finished my latest book and I'm, I'm circled back to that one and, and I'm doing it. Um, but, you know, if I would have had that same conversation a year or two ago, I probably would have pushed back just like she did and they said yeah but I like writing horror I like the way the story turned out let's just leave it at it as is but you know when you start looking at the numbers you know all the other factors involved you know sometimes it makes sense to, to pull back and do something like that well for me what was going on was I wrote a post-apocalyptic book it did okay I was in the middle of the second one and it was a lot better than the first one and like I said before I'm going to all these writers conferences and it's like you should really write a book about this police stuff and I'm like oh then I kind of tested the waters and there was a market for it. So 
I shelved the post-apocalyptic stuff in half a second. And I'm glad I did because the two police books just took off. That makes me really curious. And I've never really asked anyone this question, but like, how did, how did each of you choose your genre? I, for me, I think it just comes from what I read, you know, like I, when I was a kid, you know, I, I started off reading, um, geez, like Hardy Boys and Nancy Drews were like the first real books that I, I read. Um, then from there, I went on to all the classics of Great Expectations, you know, a lot of Charles Dickens, Mark Twain, you know, all the classic stuff. Um, the first adult book that I ever picked up was Dracula. Um, it scared the crap out of me. I was eight years old when I read that the first time. And I just, I fell in love with the idea of being scared by a book. Um, we didn't have a television in the house. I grew up with nothing but, but books around me. So like, that just it took me off in a you know direction that I didn't think books could do. You know, it was cool that they had adventures and stuff in them, you know, through you know, the musketeers and all these other fun things, but like that one scared the piss out of me. Um, and like that was just such a huge emotional reaction. I think that's why I gravitated towards it. And then I just started seeking it out, you know, looking for more, you know, scary stuff. The Exorcist, what's that about? Um, you know, I just kept going. Yeah, for me, um, part of it is like I have two co-authors. So like my three genres are basically like Academy, young adult, urban fantasy, paranormal humor, and then LGBT cozy fantasy. The cozy fantasy part is my own. And that kind of grew off of like my own interest of stories that I wanted to see and stories that I wanted to be a part of. Uh, so I remember reading your book, your brand by Dana Kay. And that book, uh, really focuses on like, what are the themes and pieces of not only your stories, but like bits of your life as well. And how can you drill that down into what your brand is? Uh, for me, that made me put a tagline, um, writer of things, dark, strange, and queer. So that's basically what I've been sticking to. Uh, so it was a mix of figuring out what my brand was and then kind of figuring out what I was quote unquote unapologetic about or what I wanted to see more of. Yeah. For me, like I like to write a lot of things. So I write, you know, fantasy, sci-fi, horror, whatever I just feel like I will write. Um, and then what happened is I, I branded with what took off. So for me, it was the sci-fi that was getting the readers. So that's the way that I branded for uh, my pen name fiction, right? So I don't know. I mean, I love sci-fi, I love fantasy, I love horror, I love thrillers. But what took off for me was sci-fi and I kind of got stuck there. For me, I enjoyed, re I enjoyed reading nonfiction. So I started writing nonfiction. And, you know, you're solving somebody's problems. And that appealed to me. And then the crime fiction stuff kicked in. You know, I, I'm in the middle of a series right now for that. And it was more or less, you know, write what you know. And it just cut, it's a natural, you know, progression and it just feels right. And it's doing pretty good. Yeah. I think I started because of the, I started writing sci-fi and I switched genres because I was on a uh, podcast. He was co-hosting a show with Nick Thacker and he writes uh, archaeological thrillers and he dared me to write a thriller on the air. And so I did. And, uh, it took off and on much like what Christine was saying. It was, it's sort of, you know, the, okay. I see the, I see the money. I see the light. I'm a thriller writer now, basically. That's kind of how it works. I think a lot of people tend to, they start off trying to write what they enjoyed reading. Um, but at the same time, the knowledge base that they have behind them starts to creep in there. And I think that in a way dictates, you know, like in Patrick's case, it dictates, you know, maybe he you know, knows a lot about this particular industry and it's going to start coming mm -hmm. out in the writing. People like they feel that authenticity when they're reading that book. Um, and it resonates a little bit better than, than something else. You know, if Patrick were to go out there and write a sci-fi novel, it's not going to hit with readers probably as well as a cop book would just simply because he's able to pull from that, that knowledge base. Um, that being said, it may not always be what we want to write you know a lot of times we write to escape right so why why would we want to write about something that we're familiar with we want to take ourselves off in a totally different world um but in the end yeah I, I think a lot of it comes down to what are you trying to get out of this are you doing this just strictly for fun for entertainment value to you know to you know give yourself a hobby or are you trying to make a living at it and if you're trying to make a living at it you've got to chase those dollars you know what are people willing to spend their dollars on and what are they going to buy of yours and can you produce more of it yeah yeah the other thing that I thought was really interesting that she talked about was leaving her agent. She said it's better not to have an agent than to have the wrong agent. I, I just like yeah. that that just gave me hives. Like, what does it mean to leave your agent and start the search again? It's, I haven't had that experience, so I'm curious if that's anything anyone else has had experience with. How many people here have agents? Nope. I don't anymore, but I have. Okay. Okay. So um 
Yeah, I mean that, that is very true. I mean, you you are literally married to your agent. Like you like I yeah. I spend more time on the phone than I do with when my relatives um with with my agent. Um I had this weird thing that happened with Fourth Monkey. I, I queried 50 some agents and I had 13 people that offered me representation. Um and the one that I and, and the one I went with was Krista Nelson out in Colorado and it originally like you know she read the book, um she loved it and she's like, "But I don't represent thriller authors, so go ahead and find somebody else, but keep me in mind, you know, down the road." Um so I ended up signing with somebody else um who was a really big agent up in New York. I signed with her on a Friday. Saturday, I get a phone call from Kristen saying, you know what? I just, I can't pass up on this book. I, I want to go ahead and rep you. Um, and I had to weigh those two people. And the, the thing was with Kristen, like I, I was very comfortable talking to her. She was like talking to my sister mm-hmm. or talking to a friend mm-hmm. when I had her on the phone. Um, with this person in New York that I had signed with, uh, I felt like every time I hung up the phone, like I just left the principal's office. Like I just got in trouble <laughs> for something. Um, and like, you know, I just, I, talk to my wife about it. I was like, do I really want to spend the next 20 years with that feeling every time I, I've got this person on the other end of the, the phone call? So I ended things with the person in New York and went with the one and, and, you know, went with Kristen. Um, and you know, like it, it's, it's such a huge, important relationship, I think in, in all of this, because they do steer your career. You know, the, one of the first readers on that book, they're going to be the ones who push, put it with a publisher. Um, you know, they're the one pushing the TV and the film stuff, you know, so all that stuff has to, it has to jive. Yeah. What kind of like jumped out at me was she said, write what you love, not what a publisher wants. And I thought, wow, that's kind of cool, but it also depends on where you are in life. I mean, if you absolutely need that money, yeah, you know, the love <laughs> may change a little bit and it's like, okay, I got to pay the electric bill this week. Yeah. There is a balance you got to strike there because, um, I remember a few, several years ago now, but I mean the whole right to market, uh, phrase we'll say <laughs> as people were talking in the self-published community, people were talking about writing to market and it was sort of, you got a mixed bag of, res- of reactions to that. Some people were really opposed to the very notion of it. And some people embraced it for what I think it really is, which is you have to understand who you're writing for and you have to tailor your books to that market. Uh, you can write anything you want, just know that markets may be limited, but ultimately we're in this, you know, we are here to run a business, to, to make money. Uh, maybe to some folks, that's a dirty, <laughs> that's a dirty idea, but I, me. I mean, no. <laughs> you know, all of us got into this to, you know, uh, to not only share our idea, if, if all you want to do is share your ideas, you can do that for free. You can share it on Wattpad or your blog or whatever. You don't have to go the publishing route. So clearly what you want is some sort of revenue from your writing. So yeah, there's a balance to strike there. Yeah, absolutely. Well, awesome. So, J.D., who's up next week? Next week, we've got Tuva Alsterdahl. She's one of Sweden's most renowned suspense authors. Her latest novel is We Know You Remember. Um, it was actually a Swedish crime novel of the year. Uh, her next one is called You Will Never Be Found, and it releases uh, at the end of this month. Great. If you'd like to be notified as soon as new episodes publish, please make sure you go to writersincpodcast.com and sign up now. We'll see you next episode and have a great week of writing. Thanks for listening to this episode of Writers Inc. Access the show notes and leave a comment at writersincpodcast.com.